Well, good evening. So good to be here tonight. We're going to take some time and we're going to be in John chapter 5 tonight. So if you'd open your Bibles to John chapter 5, and we're going to put in at the 30th verse and read down through verse 47. And our goal tonight is there's no earth shaking goal here. We're going to review this material. And. But the goal is to look at the five witnesses that the Lord Jesus Christ himself identifies as witnesses to who he is, the person and work of Christ. So we begin in John chapter 5 then, and um, verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me, His voice you've never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you had believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And that is the end of our reading tonight in the first passage. So let's ask the Lord to bless it. Father, we ask you to be with us tonight. We've opened your word. We ask you to bless our understanding and uh, that you would um, unfold the teaching tonight, that the teaching would be of you without error, and uh, would be edifying and strengthening for you people. For we seek to glorify you, and we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So the last time I was up, I spent some time in the middle part of this chapter, and now we're going to take up the last part of this chapter. But just as a a way to review. The goal tonight is we're going to examine the five witnesses. Jesus brings forth five witnesses. And uh, in order to boost our confidence in the truthfulness of the scripture and glorify God Almighty for his clarity on the issue of the deity of Christ and the unity and equality of the Godhead. So, uh, but first we got to ask the question, how do we get here? You know, if you haven't read John chapter 5 in a while, you might wonder, well, what are the events that led up to Jesus' teaching about these five witnesses? So, just as an overview, these events begin with Jesus healing a man at the pool of Bethesda. Now, the man had a serious affliction for 38 years. You know, we don't really know what it was that he had, but we know he couldn't walk. And Jesus heals him, saying to him, Simply this, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And of course, it was the Sabbath. 
Now, this is a theme repeated throughout the book of John. Jesus often healed on the Sabbath. And this is actually, Jesus was picking a fight with the Pharisees by healing on the Sabbath. Now, there's a greater purpose to this that we'll see. It isn't just Jesus picking a fight. He has a point to make, and he's going to make it. Now, uh, the Pharisees knew who this man was. Now, how can I say that? Well, because he had been at the pool daily for a long time. Uh, But it's doubtful that they knew his name. I say they knew the man because the Pharisees were the religious police. They they were sort of in control of everyday uh, religious expression. Now, some background on how did they become the religious police and and how did this how did this come about? Well, when the Romans conquered Israel about 70 years before this, uh, they wisely left the day-to-day administration of the religious affairs of the nation to the Sadducees, who were the priestly class, and the Pharisees, who were the doctrinal overlords. And, and the religious police, if you will, and the scribes who are often mentioned along with the Pharisees. You know, you see this in the scripture, the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, the scribes, they were the scholars, the experts in the law. Uh, they were the lawyers. And so, um, so these three parties, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes, they ran the whole system of worship and obedience to the law as they interpreted. They ran it for all of Israel. And you could see the wisdom of the Romans because since Israel had had a history of being a theocracy, if they simply controlled the religious side of this, then they could get the population in general to knuckle under to Roman rule. So, uh, it, it, but this arrangement that they made with the uh, Roman government was extremely lucrative. I mean, so they not only controlled religious uh, practice, but you know, there was a lot of selling of animals and money changing and all kinds of things that was uh, hooked up with the temple worship. And without a doubt, they got a piece of the action. And, uh, And so it was a very lucrative deal. So the status quo was very important to the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the scribes. Uh, Now, we also know this about these three groups of people, including the world at large. And that is, these groups were enemies of God. I I remember when I first came to Calvinism, and I'm allowed, I can say that on a Sunday night, is that right? When I first came to Calvinism, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the representatives of Calvinism said to me, my son, he said, you know, he said, the unsaved people hate God. Oh, man, that just drove me crazy. I go it over in about two or three days, you know, digging into the scriptures, but that was offensive to me. But what does the scripture say? Um When I say they were enemies of God, I say this because they resisted Jesus at every turn and and eventually delivered him up to the Romans to be crucified on false charges. But at least one of the charges that they leveled against him was true. And that is that he claimed to be God. And so in that particular instance, they were true. Uh, Now, their resistance to God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, was the pure poison of pragmatism. How do you like that? Three Ps. I could probably preach Sunday morning. I've got three Ps right there. The pure poison of pragmatism. You know, pragmatism is when you don't do what's true. You, You might do what's true accidentally. But what you really do is what is beneficial to you, what works. You know, and, uh, and, and you don't pay much attention to whether it's right or wrong. That's not the issue. It is what works. And, of course, what works for them is to remain in power. The status quo worked for them. Uh, so 
You see this in John chapter 11. We won't turn there, but let me read this to you. Remember, there was a, he healed uh, Lazarus. Remember that? And uh, some people who walked away from that healing, some people walked away and said, wow, he must be the Messiah. And other people walked away from that meeting going, wow, we're going to have to kill him. And there were actually two groups that walked away from that miracle with that diametrically opposed idea. So I say that they were enemies of God because um, essentially what the book of Romans tells us is that in the unregenerate state, we are enemies to God. It's not that God is our enemy, it's that we are enemies to him. And in another place it says we are at enmity with him, uh, King James Version. Uh, but... Um, Anyway, in Romans, again, in John eleven eight, 8, if we let him go on like this, if we let him continue, if he continues healing people and feeding 5,000 at a time with a few loaves and a few fishes, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take both our place and our nation. Notice what they were interested in first, their place. And then, of course, we've got we've to save the nation, but our place and our nation. At this point in the story, their beef with Jesus is that he healed this man on the Sabbath day. That's where this begins. He healed this man at the Sabbath day. Now, turn back to John and look at, if you're still open to John, look at the 16th verse. 16th verse of John 5. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So that's where the beef begins. He's healing on the Sabbath, can't do any good works on the Sabbath. You know, that's a bad deal, according to them. But Jesus answered them, well, my father's working until now, and I am working. So Jesus throws another log on the fire, hits it with a little bit of gasoline so it'll spring up real good, and now they're really mad. Verse 18, or yeah, verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So that's sort of the background. That's how we get to this point. There's a dialogue just, or a monologue from Jesus just before this. But what I want to look at is the five witnesses. And we're beginning, going to begin with John the Baptist. So turn to John 1 for just a second. Now, remember, in the fifth chapter, as we were looking at it, at it, Jesus said to them, you sent to John. Okay, so they sent emissaries to John. And he is borne witness to the truth. Uh, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. So Jesus is just not interested in poking them in the eye and picking a fight with them. He's saying these things so that they might be saved. But notice, he says, he was. Jesus says, John the Baptist was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So the emissaries that they sent to John the Baptist were moved by the witness of John the Baptist. And perhaps even when they brought the news back, some of the Pharisees were moved. So let's look at what John says. So we're at John 1, and we're going to be at the 19th verse. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in John 5. And, of course, they asked him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, well, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, oh, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. This comes out of Isaiah 41. This is a absolutely, and maybe this is what stunned him. Of course, John the Baptist, people from all over Judea and, and the surrounding areas were coming out to uh, 
to be baptized by John in the River Jordan. So he was notorious, if you want to say, or he was uh, famous, if you'd like to say. But he was gathering huge crowds, and that's why they went to interview him. So how does our Lord say that they reacted to John's testimony? Well, they were willing to rejoice in it for a while. Otherwise, they believed his testimony. But what happens? Well, much like the seed that was sown on rocky ground in Mark 4, they believed it for a short while, and then they got pushed back from their fellow Pharisees. At least that's what I think happened. Maybe they got pushed back from their wives or their kids. Who knows? But they got pushed back. And they rejected. In the end, they rejected John's testimony. And we see this phenomena often in preaching the gospel. If you've ever witnessed a family members or, or friends, you see a spark of light in them. And, and, and then they are asking you a few questions. And then you buy them a Bible, you know. And, uh, and then you send it to a UPS or whatever. And... And then you hear nothing. You hear nothing. Uh, they seem to agree. They even show joy in hearing the good news and belief that Jesus Christ as Savior brings with it the assurance of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But the next time you see them, maybe days or weeks later, there's no interest. There's no fruit. And there's no joy. I have a sister like this. You might pray for her. Her name is Valerie. I haven't pounced on her again. I've let this thing sort of simmer. I sent her a Bible and all of those things, but uh, I'm, you might pray for her. Her name is Valerie. As the parable of the sower says, so this is in John chapter 4, this is the, those who are sown on rocky ground. They hear the word. And immediately they receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. What will my friends think? What are my parents going to think? How will the world think about me? These are those who believed on their own volition or their own choice or their own free will from an unregenerate heart and were never born again. Their supposed faith was based solely upon the reasonableness of the gospel and their own fleshly heart. Now back to those who interviewed John the Baptist. One can imagine how much pressure these emissaries of the Pharisees were under when they reported back to those who sent them to interview John. They probably thought, well, you guys are... Well, here's probably what they thought. They were like the temple officers. Remember the temple officers who, officers who were sent to arrest Jesus? And they came back empty-handed. Do you remember that? And, and saying that they, they didn't arrest him because never a man spoke like this. And they were immediately ridiculed by those who sent them, accusing them of going against the consensus of the Pharisees and being accursed for not knowing the law. Well, you guys are just idiots. None of the Pharisees have believed any of this, and, and you are uh, you're a curse because you don't know the law. So, back to our text. It is here that Jesus, on his part, lays aside the testimony of John because he has a greater one. He doesn't need the testimony of men. He's going to go to a greater testimony now. So he brings forth the second witness, the works of the Father, Come back to John 5 for a second, and let's reread uh, verses 36 through 38. 36 through 38. Now, he's laid aside the, the testimony of John. He's not going to use it, but notice 36. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the, words that the, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish... The very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard in his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you. So here, they, um, if we spent the time, if, if I went around the room and said, to everybody in this room, I'm going to call on you in 10 minutes, but 
Think of a verse in the New Testament that's quoted in the Old Testament. Well, I think most of us could think of a verse in the New Testament that's actually quoted in the Old Testament. And we could recount multiple, uh, for instance, in the healings of people, we could recount multiple people that the Pharisees knew were afflicted with various diseases. These are the works of God, the works of God, the healing. Because Je uh, Jesus rarely did anything in secret. Many times he did these miracles on the Sabbath in the synagogue for all to see. But there were many who experienced eternal salvation because of the witness of the works that the Father had given Jesus to do. And I can think of two. Remember Nicodemus? When he uh, went to see Jesus by night, he made this statement, We know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Now, the Pharisees were seeing the signs. They didn't come to that conclusion, but Nicodemus did. Now, we're not sure about Nicodemus when he came to faith, but he was at the burial of Jesus. Remember, he helped Joseph of Arimathea prepare the body and uh, bury it. So I think we could safely say he was a believer. And then um, the second one I, I want to bring up, someone who was moved by a sign is found in uh, John chapter 9. Let's go there for just a second. John chapter 9. I love this one because I like sarcasm. I actually believe sarcasm is a gift. And uh, so I'm just joking. Not really. But sarcasm is really interesting, and Jesus uses it sometimes. And the Father in the Old Testament uses it sometimes. But here in John chapter 9, Notice the 24th verse. Now, to set this up, here's a man that's at least 20 years old because he's of age, so he's at least 20. He's been blind from birth. Everybody knows who he is. The local religious police, the Pharisees, they know who he is. And Jesus comes along and heals him. And then um, in the hubbub of everything that was going on, he didn't catch Jesus' name. He... He gets caught up in the crowd, and then the Pharisees get called in. You know, they got to figure out what's going on. I mean, you know, this was some spiritual thing that happened, and they are the police over all this stuff. So they question his parents, and then finally, they get around to questioning him. And we begin in the 24th verse. 24, so for the second time, they called the man who had been blind. Now, they've already interviewed him one time. They called, uh, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, here's the blind man's answer. I love this answer. Well, whether he's a sinner, I do not, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that I was blind and now I see. And they said to him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I've told you already. And you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. And the man answered, this is the poll quote right here. This is so what's so wonderful. Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. What kind of... Religious police are you. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and, and, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. So they didn't get his logic. Evidently, it was too logical and too truthful, so they just cast him out. And, uh, of course, later he, he meets up with the Lord, and his salvation is completed. Maybe it was ple completed before that, but he comes to uh, confess his faith in Christ. Now, I like that because I like sarcasm. And when he said, wow, this is an amazing thing, I thought, what a great line. Now, witness number three is the scripture, and I sort of used some of the the stuff I got off my notes a little bit and used some I was going to use here. But we, excuse me, num witness number three is the father. 
the Father in heaven. And so let's read verse 37 of John 5. Just to refresh our memory what we're talking about. We're looking at the five witnesses and we're on witness number three. Verse 37, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard and his form you've never seen. Now, where can you think of in the scripture where the Father spoke from heaven witnessing about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the baptism. Remember, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Certainly, certainly there were people present when that happened. Because there were always people around John the Baptist. And the second time we know is the transfiguration. Remember, Peter had some brilliant idea after seeing the Lord transfigured. Peter always had brilliant ideas. He says, I, don't, I know what we'll do. We'll build three tabernacles right here for you and Elijah and I think it was Moses, and, uh, and his voice comes out of heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And uh, so that's the second time. But there's a third time, and if we find it in John 12. Let's go there. I just want to look at this for a moment, John 12. This is uh, in the Passion Week. It's, it might be the day of the triumphal entry, and... Um, there's a lot of people milling around. He's in a crowd. There's discussions going on. And notice in the 27th verse of John 12, he's sort of, he, he's talking about a number of things. And he makes this statement, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I've glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it thundered. And the other said, an angel has spoken to him. You know, the unregenerate cannot hear the words of God. They just cannot. You can catechize them. You can teach them memory verses. You can do all number of things with an unregenerate person. But they can hear the words, but they can't spiritually hear the words. Uh, they can memorize the words, but the word has no lasting effect in their life. Why is that? Because it is the Spirit of God that takes the word of God and changes our heart, our minds, and eventually our lives. So let's go on to witness number four. Witness number four is the Holy Scriptures. This is where I messed up earlier when I started using part of this passage. But the volume of evidence in the Scriptures is absolutely overwhelming. And what I'm talking about, Old Testament references finding their way, not accidentally, by, by the way, since God is the author of Scripture, they find their way into the New Testament by the Holy Spirit. Someone has calculated that there are well over a thousand quotations and references from the Old Testament found in the New Testament. Now, I don't know how they calculated that. I believe it's true. I believe the number might be a lot bigger than that. You know, because there's a lot of different ways you can count it. You can count a direct quotation, or you can count something that alludes to an Old Testament truth as a reference to Old Testament. But... I want to just look at Hebrews 10 here for just a second. Hebrews 10. This is one of my favorite Old Testament references found in the New Testament. Hebrews 10. And if you're an animal lover, I have good news for you. This might be the only thing new in this whole teaching tonight. But notice Hebrews 10 and they're talking, he's teaching about the sacrifice and the priestly system and the temple and all of the things that pertain to the temple. And he says in verse 5, consequently, this is the writer of Hebrews speaking, consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, this is Christ speaking, this is Old Testament, I think it comes out of, uh, I think it's Psalm 40. I didn't go back and check the reference, but I believe it's Psalm 40. Here's what, 
Here's what was said of Christ. Sacrifice and Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I come to do your will, O God, as it is written in the scroll of the book. King James Version, I like it a little bit better, the last part of that. It says, In the volume of the book it is written of me. And of course, what book is that? Well, that's the Old Testament. That's where we find all the types, all the shadows, and all of the direct prophecies concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are scores and scores of them. Uh, there are direct prophecies like Deuteronomy 18, where, where uh, Moses says, the Lord will raise up a prophet unto you like me, and you will hear him. And we're going to look at that at the end when Peter actually makes this quote. Isaiah 7, 14, and the virgin shall bring forth a child. Who's that speaking of? That's a direct prophecy. And Isaiah 9, 6 and 9, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's... Jesus in the Old Testament. And then Isaiah 53, which is, I, I think I've preached the gospel from Isaiah 53 at assisted living from that passage alone probably 15 times because I try to use it once a year because we have a high turnover at assisted living. But it is a wonderful chapter. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. What a marvelous presentation of the gospel. So the scriptures bear witness to Christ. Who else could it be but him? And this is in addition to the types and the shadows. We can think of two types right away. Adam is a type of Christ. Adam is the bad guy. Christ is the good guy. I know that's an oversimplification, but Adam sinned. Christ was sinless. Adam brought death into the world. Christ brought life, everlasting life to all those who believe. And then, of course, I, I think Joseph is a type of Christ. Uh, rejected by his brethren, what does he become? King of the world. Essentially, king of the world. Now, but the shadows in the Old Testament, in the holiness laws, in the temple rituals, are just too numerous to even mention. In fact, when we get back to Exodus, we'll be looking at some of these things on the clothing of the priests and, and other issues like that that shadow forth the person and work of Christ. So here's my, here's my deal for those who struggle because they love animals and they see all these animals slaughtered in the Old Testament. Right here in this passage... The Bible tells us that God did not take pleasure in that at all. What did he take pleasure in it about? Because it was a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a picture of the obedience of the Son to the Father. It was a picture of life everlasting being given to his people. Now... I need to sort of wind this up, so let's go to, um, there's one section here, and, and we'll probably close in this part right here, John 5. There's a reason why we stumble, by the way. At the end of John 5, he's going to bring Moses forward as a witness, and you wonder, well, why doesn't he just include that in the scriptures? Well, because the scriptures are the general witness but for the Pharisees who claim to be disciples of Moses, he is the primary witness to them. But let me show you what one of the stumbling blocks to belief is. And we find it here. I, I, first of all, laying aside the sovereignty of God, just what are the human stumbling blocks to belief? And we have it here. In, beginning in verse 40, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. 
People do that, you know. I do not receive glory from people, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? How can you believe? You know, our world is built on self-glorification. Buy this makeup and you'll be a Hollywood star. Buy, drive this car and the girls will love you. Um, you know, our whole advertising system works this way. Um, you know, if, I don't know if you're a daydreamer, I'll just make a confession. When you daydream, do you ever dream that somebody else is the hero of your story? No, you're the hero. When you daydream, you're the hero. I used to listen to music and I played a little bit and I would listen to a piece of music and I really liked the lead part. And it, you think I'm envisioning Ben playing the lead part? Boy, that Ben, he can really... No, I'm envisioning me playing the lead part. We are by nature self-glorifiers. And there isn't much room in our life at all for God when we are the biggest thing in our life. So I want to close there, but I want to urge you tonight, I know in this room tonight, there are people who have never been born again. They've been catechized. They've been taught the scripture and all of those things. But there's a point in your life where you have to make Christ your own. You have to trust him for yourself. You can't get there on your parents' salvation. I don't mean to be too pointed. I just need to say this. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? He didn't say that. Yes, he did say that. What must I do to be saved? What was the answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And so tonight, if you're, if you, even if you were trained up in the scripture, uh, if you are skillful in the Westminster Catechism, I would urge you to make the faith your own, to trust God with your eternal soul. And uh, well, may the Lord bless his word. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have a song. So, Father, I want to just thank you for this time, and really want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for saving my soul Many years ago, I wasn't looking for it. I didn't even know what it was. But you reached into my heart and changed it and showed me the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believed in him and was translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And it's our prayer tonight that everybody in this room tonight would examine their own hearts to see if they're in the faith and trust in Christ as their Savior as we pray in his name. Amen.